I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. Let me try that again. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let's stand and join the praise and worship team. God, we thank you for this day. Yes. We pray, Lord, that you would prepare our minds and hearts to give you the best worship that we have. Yes. Knowing, Lord, that human language is the poverty of speech, we pray that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart would be acceptable in your sight because you are our Lord. Yes. You are our Redeemer. Yes. And we thank you, Lord. So today, we pray that you will bless the praise team. We pray that you will bless the message that Bishop will bring. We pray that you would bless every single person in this sanctuary, that you will bless those that are tuning in online, and that your spirit will be present with us, Lord, and that you would give us, Lord God, just a refreshment, a renewal, a revival, Heavenly Father, we will be changed when we leave this place. Amen. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen. 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 I want to welcome you all to Christ Temple Cathedral. Where we are a Christ-centered church connecting people to Jesus Christ and to one another. And it is always a delight to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 
So certainly want to acknowledge those that are tuning in online. We thank you for being here as well. And at this time, Bishop will come forward with our morning announcements. This is a day that the Lord hath made. There are many reasons to rejoice today. We rejoice in the God of our salvation. We rejoice in the fellowship that we have one with another. And we rejoice that it's not raining yet. Amen, amen, and amen. Just a couple of announcements that, again, if you made contributions to the church last year and you would like to get a statement to be used for the purposes of, of your taxes or just simply to know uh, what you gave in terms of your contributions, uh, please see our church treasurer, Brother Bingham, who's standing at the rear door and normally stands around the offering, or Brother Howard Young, and they'll be glad to get those statements to you. We had a great business meeting yesterday online and things went out very, very well. I think there's some exciting things that are uh, that we have planned for our near future. We're going to be renovating this space and uh, kind of bringing it up to updating it and changing the lighting. And those are some things that are in process. Trust that you will pray for us as we uh, work through all that. Please uh, remember uh, Sister Anderson, whose husband was funeralized on yesterday in Pearl, Mississippi. We um, knew that knew her for what she was a member here at Christ Temple for at least about 50 years, and they re relocated back to Brandon, Mississippi. His services were held yesterday, and uh, we want to remember her in our thoughts and in our prayers. We uh, have another funeral service that'll be here on the 16th of, uh, of a Mrs. Cleo Calhoun, a member of, uh, uh, of my family, will be held here at 12 o'clock. The announcement went out at, for 11, but the actual funeral service will be here at 12. Let's remember to give at our tithes and offering. You give as you leave the church. Uh, one of the deacons will be there to assist you if you need any assistance. Something very special today that I would like to do. Uh, last Sunday, I was told that in my absence, people joined the church. And so I'm thankful to welcome Samuel and Connie this morning. And we uh, praise the Lord for their presence. Amen. And, and I want them to remain standing for just a moment because uh, before you leave today, I'd like for most of you all to go by and shake their hands for many reasons. But another reason would be that they were here this morning at 10 a.m. Amen. At 10 a.m. Thank you, Frank. On time, on time, ahead of time, on ahead of time. I want to give to them, though, the everyday Bible. This uh, I've been talking about reading the Bible through in 2024, uh, and had a schedule. The schedule is still back there on those one of those little tables. Uh, that will guide you through the Bible so that by the end of the year, you will read the Bible completely through. Uh, but I found something even better than that. I found an everyday Bible that um, it's already divided for you. So you'll read a passage in the Old Testament, a passage in the New Testament or chapter, and then something from the Psalms and something from the book of Proverbs every day. And if you do it on a daily basis, if you're consistent or keep up as best you can, you will have gone through the Bible uh, at, by the end of the year. So I am uh, going to just give these to, we're going to give them to all new members, but we're going to start by giving them to Samuel and Connie. Um, and they are available to others, okay? Switched it up on me a little bit this morning. It's all right. Say, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready, huh? Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 23. If you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 23.
it reads, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 23. And may God add a blessing to the hearer, reader, and doer of his holy word. Would you like the congregation to remain standing? Oh, that's right. Okay. Yes. Yo, please, please uh, take your seats. All right. I'm going to get it together, y'all. All right. So now, as you all are aware, uh, this is the month of February. Um, this Sunday marks the first Sunday in Black History Month it being the month of February. And we certainly want to celebrate um, the black experience in America and make note of those who have made great contributions to uh, the success of being black in America, hence why we are here. So at this time, Sister Marie has come forward as being the coordinator to kind of share a bit more context and color around what we'll be discussing this month. And so let's give Sister Marie a round of applause for her efforts. Black History Month. Uh, can someone tell me the year that Black History Month was established? No. Sister Crew, you remember? No, believe it or not, it was 1976. It was officially established. And the president was, anybody know who the president was? Gerald Ford. Who said Gerald Ford? Howard. You get a gift card from Starbucks. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that that's exactly right. It was Gerald Ford, um, the scholar that actually uh, founded this was Carter G. Woodson. He was a scholar whose dedication to celebrating the historical contributions of black people led to the establishment of Black History Month, which has been marked every February since 1976. So that's the moment in Black history. But uh, one of the things about it is that Black History Month allows for us to learn, celebrate, and pay tribute to the contributions of Black leaders. In fact, this morning we're going to be singing from his fullness song, Sister Carlotta reminded me about Bishop C.P. Jones that has indeed impacted not only Church of Christ Holiness, but his songs are now sung around the world internationally. That you can go on hymns.org and you can find Bishop C.P. Jones songs that are now online. We've come a long way from him being the founder of this organization. So we have a lot to be thankful for. Let's give him a round of applause. 
And I never took the time to actually read the dedication, but in this book is the dedication from Bishop C.P. Jones. Take an opportunity to take this book from behind the pew and read what his dedicated remarks are to Church of Christ Holiness, a reminder about Jesus only in his fullness songs. So as every year, the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History selects a national theme. The national theme for Black History Month this year is and is chosen by the African-American Life and History Organization. The theme is African Americans and the Art. The theme is a reminder that the influence of African American on the arts has been significant, spanning visual and performing arts, literature, fashion, poetry, language, film, music, culinary arts, and other forms of cultural expression. African American artists have used their art to preserve history and community awareness and to empower themselves and their communities. It is so important as we as African Americans take the time, especially in the month of February, to take pride in what we have accomplished over the years that has impacted so many Americans, not just black Americans, but Americans in general. And we have a lot to be thankful for because a lot of it has been established out of the black churches. So uh, with that being said, our presenter this morning is Sister Joanne Hardy. That's my sister. Okay. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's such a blessing to be here. You know, I applaud all of you that's here with all the bad news that we got in regards to the coming weather. It's just a blessing to see each one of you. Stay prayed up and stay safe today. <laughs> um, this morning, as previously mentioned, we are celebrating Black History Month with the theme this year, African Americans and the Arts in that I am an enthusiast of poetry. I am pleased to speak about a very gifted black poet, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was an American poet, novelist, and short story writer of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He stands out as the first Negro poet in the United States to show a combined mastery over poetic material and poetic technique. He was the first to rise to a height from which he could take a perspective view of his own race. He was first to see objectively his humor, his superstitions, his shortcomings, the first to feel sympathetically his heart wounds, his yearnings, his aspirations, and to voice them all in a purely literary form. Paul was born in Dayton, Ohio on June 27, 1872, to parents who were enslaved in Kentucky before the American Civil War. After being emancipated, his mother moved to Dayton, Ohio with other family members. Don Barr's father, Joshua, escaped from slavery in Kentucky before the war ended. He traveled to Massachusetts, I can never say that word right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and volunteered for the 55th Infantry Regiment, one of the first two black units to serve in the war. His father died on August 16, 1885, when Paul was 13 years old. Dunbar wrote his first poem at the age of six and gave his first public recital at the age of nine. His mother assisted him in schooling. She often read the Bible with him and thought that he might become a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the first independent black denomination in America, founded in Philadelphia in the early 19th century. Paul was the only Negro student during his years at Central High School in Dayton, Ohio. He was elected as president of the school's literary society and became the editor of the school newspaper. He was also a member of the Day debate club 
and became friends with classmate Orville Wright. The Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright, are credited for their work as American aviation pioneers. Dunbar published his poems for the first time when he was 16. Two of his poems appeared in the Dayton Herald newspaper. Two years later, he wrote and edited the city's first weekly American, African-American newspaper called The Tattler, which was printed by the Wright brothers. Pays to be friends with the right people, doesn't it? <laughs> Despite having a high school diploma, which was rare at that time for either blacks or whites, the only work he could get was an elevator operator in the Callahan building downtown. He wrote whenever he could and jumped at the opportunity when a former teacher invited him to speak in 1892 at the Western Association of Writers. In 1897, Dunbar traveled to England for a literary tour. He recited his works on the London circuit. He was active in the civil rights movements and helped found the American Negro Academy. When he lived in Washington, DC, he attended, he attended Howard University. He had a number of high profile friends during his life. He remained close friends with the Wright brothers and was also friends with Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass. Douglass once referred to Dunbar as one of the sweetest songsters his race has produced and a man of whom he hoped would do great things. Dunbar attended both of Theodore Roosevelt's presidential inaugurations. The two shared a brief correspondence. Dunbar sent the president a poem and Roosevelt in return sent poems to Dunbar. Roosevelt later presented Dunbar with a ceremonial sword. Poet and author Paul Lawrence Dunbar was so adept at writing verse in African-American dialect that he was called the poet of his people. He had such talent and versatility that his brilliant work crossed racial barriers and won him both critical and popular success. Dunbar was diagnosed with tuberculosis in 1900 and died from the disease on February 9, 1906 at the age of 33 years old. During his short career, he published 12 books of poetry, four books of short stories, four novels, and a play. No other African-American published as many books as he did until 1950. A number of schools and other locations around the country have been named in his honor. The Paul Lawrence Dunbar U.S. Postal Stamp was issued May 1, 1975, which cost 10 cents. Dunbar's home in Dayton, Ohio has been preserved as Lawrence, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's house, a state historical site. In regards to his success as a writer and poet, he was quoted as saying, with it all, I can, cannot help being overwhelmed by self-doubts. I hope there's something worthy in my writings and not merely the novelty of a black face associated with the power to rhyme that has attracted attention. Douglas had two styles of writing regarding his poetry. Some of his poems were written in standard English, which is the form of English that is taught and understood around the world. The other style is used, he used was written in African American dialect, which was the way that most blacks spoke at that time, especially if they lived in the South and had little to no formal education. The reason that I am somewhat familiar with this poet, with his work, is because my mother had a book of poems written by Dunbar. As a child growing up, she would often read some of his poems to us. This morning, no surprise to you, right? I would like to share two of his poems that will show the difference in the two styles of his writing. This first poem that I'm sharing with you is written in the standard English form and it is entitled, Dreams. What dreams we have and how they fly like rosy clouds across the sky of wealth, of fame, of sure success, of love that comes to cheer and bless and how they wither, how they fade, the waning wealth, the jilting jade, the fame that for a moment gleams, then flies forever, dreams, ah, dreams. 
That's the first L. The next is, this was written in Negro or Black dialect style. Just to give you some context so that you'll be able to understand what the poem is about. It's about a mother trying to get her son up out of the bed, but he's moving slower than she desires for him to move. It is entitled, In the Morning. Lies, lies, bless the Lord. Don't you know the day I'm brought? If and you don't get up here, you scamp, there'll be trouble in this camp. Think I gwine to let you sleep while you make your bold and keep. That's a pretty howdy do. Don't you hear me, lies you? <laughs> Bet if I come cross this flow, you won't find no time to snow. Daylight all a shining in. Where you sleep while his a sin. Ain't the candlelight enough to burn out without a snuff? But you go to morning too, burning up the daylight too. Lies, don't you hear me when I call? No use turning to that there wall. I can hear that mattress squeak. Don't you hear me when I speak? March yourself and wash your face. Don't you splatter all over this place. Look here, boy, I let you see. You shan't roll your eyes at me. <laughs> Sit down at that table there. Just you whimper if you dare. Every morning on this place seem like I must lose my grace. Fold your hands and bow your head. Wait until the pastor said, Lord, have mercy on our souls. Don't you dare touch them, their robes. Bless this food we going to eat. You sit still, I see your feet. You just try that trick again. Give us peace and joy. Amen. Written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. <laughs> Thank you. And sing with us. There's a happy day at hand.
voice and sing. Yeah. 
Hardy is saying that we need to remind us, remind one another who wrote that particular anthem for the African-American community. Langston Hughes, right? No. I got that wrong. James Weldon Johnston. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That's what I get. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Allow me this morning to invite you to take your Bibles and come with me to Ephesians chapter 2. You'll find the verses up on the screen, uh, on the monitor there, and I will read verses 1 through 10. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you he hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him, beforehand, that we should walk in them. But God, but God. Several years ago, when I began to work with the Sheriff's Department as a chaplain, I was quite surprised in being at the uh, station or being uh, with the deputies and um, realizing how much interest there was in this TV program series, The Walking Dead. The zombies. Uh, I, I was just amazed at how much energy there was in their discussion about who was still alive and how they were connected and who was going to be taken out of the next episode. And, and there was just all kinds of energy and they were comparing notes on the various characters, who they liked and who they didn't like. And personally, I had never paid much attention to the show. And to be truthful, even to this day, I have never watched a single episode. There, there's, just, there's just something about walking dead folks, I find uh, that's a bridge too far. I, I just, and I'm able to get into that. And I, I say that, you know, quite sincerely. And then I opened my Bible this week, and as I prepare for the uh, word today, I'm reminded here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, and you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Paul the apostle is saying if we listen and if we hear him this morning that we all at one time were walking dead. Every one of us. And he spoke to me in a very vivid way by the Spirit, as it were, and through the Word of God, that Emory, whether you realize it or not, you are surrounded by walking dead people. 
Now, they may not look all ugly and hideous as they are made up on television, but this verse describes the condition of every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl who is apart from Jesus Christ. If we are not in a relationship with Christ, if we are separated, if we are far from God this morning, we are dead men, women, boys, and girls. We are all dead men walking. Now, I, and you might ask, well, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I take exception to that. And I, and I, play, I pray that you'll uh, not throw anything at me. But this is the Bible way of looking at all men and women who are not connected to Christ. We're not sick. We are dead. And what do you mean by dead, Pastor? Well, physically, we are very much alive. Physically, we're able to go and come and talk and, 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 and do all kinds of things in terms of our natural life, our physical being. But spiritually, spiritually, we are dead because we have no relationship. We have no real fellowship with the living God. We not only have no fellowship, no relationship with God, but we have even no desire, no real appetite for the things of God. As a matter of fact, when I am separated from God, if I have not made that step of faith whereby I have decided to live for Christ and enter into a relationship, what the Bible calls the born-again experience, not only do I not desire the things of God, I frankly find them very boring. I find them bothersome. I'm not interested really in going to church. I have no desire whatsoever to read a Bible. I don't sing the hymns of the church. I'm simply not interested. All that stuff may work well for somebody else, but it's not for me. It's not my story, and it's not what I desire. The Bible says that's the attitude of our heart when we are dead in trespasses and sin. When we are far from God, when there is no relationship, this is the way we were before we come to Christ by faith. We were insensitive, hostile, indifferent, uh, unconcerned about the things of God. You may be well-educated. You may be uh, very well-to-do this morning. Uh, you might be a nice person. You might be what your neighbors refer to as a good person. But the coroner's report would say, spiritually, you are DOA. You are dead on arrival. We come into the world, and sometimes we find this very offensive, but we come into the world desirous to go our own way, do our own thing. We have a desire to run, uh, to run our life in the way that we feel we ought to live our lives, and we don't want God or anybody else telling us what to do or getting in our way. The Bible refers to this as that we walked according to the course of this world. We did what the world does. We lusted and lied and lived loosely we followed the prince of the power of the air. We were not only dead in trespasses and sin, meaning that we willfully walked away from God, meaning that we are born in sin and we come in with a disposition that is opposed to what God would have for my life. You see, there's something about what granddaddy Adam did 
when in the garden, God said, Adam and Eve, you may eat of every tree in the garden, but the tree here in the center, the knowledge of good and evil, you are not to eat thereof, because in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And when Eve yielded to the temptation of the serpent and gave it to her husband, the Bible says in that day they died. They did not die physically that day, but they began the process that led to physical death. And then eventually they were going to die physically, but instantly they died spiritually. They no longer desired to have fellowship with God. God would come down every day and walk with them and talk with them in the cool of the garden. But the Bible says in the day that they ate of the fruit, when they disobeyed God, that fellowship, that relationship was broken. And when God came down that evening to talk to them, according to Genesis, the Bible says that they went and hid themselves because they were no longer comfortable in the presence of the living God. The natural man is dead in trespasses and sin. We are sinners by birth and we are sinners by choice. We come into the world with an Adamic nature and the Adamic nature says, Lord, you mind your business, and I'll mind mine. Lord, you do your thing, and I'll do my thing. This is me, Lord. I'm going to run it the way I want to run it. We are dead in trespasses and sin. That is the status of all men, all women, all boys, all girls and even babies born into the world, born into sin, born into rebellion, born into I want to do my own thing. That's the attitude of the human heart. And Paul writes to the church here and says, you have he made alive who were dead in trespasses. You were dead and for you to fully appreciate the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you must understand the bad news. And the bad news is that all of us at one time, let me tell you something, mark it down. Every now and then I heard somebody say it not too long ago in this church, standing up, giving a word. They were saying that, well, you know, I've, I've always been kind of connected to the church and I've always been um, um, sort of a person who believes. I, 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 no, you haven't. No, you haven't. You may have had some religion, but you didn't have salvation. You may have been connected in that you know some church songs, you know Amazing Grace, and you know John 3.16, and you're familiar with the workings of the church. But the natural man, until God does something in my heart, till God does something in my life, until I have an encounter with the true and living God where I am born again by the Spirit of God, my natural desire is to go against God. That's the natural desire of the human heart. Now you might put some money in church. You might open the door for the blind person. You might do all kinds of nice things that does not mean that you are connected to god that does not mean that you have a relationship because you have the capacity to do some nice behave some nice thing but the bible says here and i want you to understand this because um the the fact of the matter is this is so vitally important prior to coming to christ we all have this as a part of our past we every one of us has lived according to the course of this world we think like this world thinks people come to church and you hear a preacher if you dare today speak on certain 
issues of lifestyle. And we begin to say, well, um, you know, well, what's wrong with that? And I don't see anything wrong with that. And I don't see anything wrong. I, I don't, see, you know, because the reason we don't see anything wrong with it is because we're not thinking after the word and the spirit of God. We are thinking on our own. And so we follow the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan, my friend. And Satan, he controls the thinking, the mindset of this world. The devil is in charge of this world world as far as God allows. He runs the agenda of the world around us. Why is there so much hatred and violence and war and mess in our society? Why are our children so confused? Why is there so much rebellion? Why does a son cut off the head of his father and display it on Instagram? Why do we have mass shootings? Satan runs the course of this world. We live in a world that is hostile toward the word and the wisdom and the will of God. As long as we are part of this world, we think like this world. We are dead. We are controlled by the devil and we are disobedient, and we are deceived. We are deceived into thinking that God's against me. Look, God doesn't want me to have any fun. The reason that God tells me not to whore around is because God doesn't want me to have any fun. No, God doesn't want you to mess up your life with STDs that are on the rise, that are soaring out of sight in our world today. We're saying now and reading in the paper this week how that syphilis is out of control in America. God doesn't want you to have children all over town. God wants you to be faithful to one man, one woman. God wants you to build a home that your children can be raised in the security where daddy loves mama, mama loves daddy, and they work together. That's what God wants for you. But we don't have enough sense to see that God is for us. We don't understand that every one of those 10 commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness. That is God trying to protect us, not keep fun from us. Well, pastor, now wait a minute. I thought the same thing at one time. I lived, I, I was brought up in this Christian home. Dad was a deacon in the church. Mother was involved. Grandmother was involved. I went to church every Sunday. I had one agenda, get out of this Christian household and act a fool. That was, that was, that was my agenda. Because God doesn't want me to have any fun, and I want to have some fun. I want to go to the club. I want to stand on the corner. I want to give me some 40 ounces. That's what I'm after. Hey. I, somebody told me it wasn't 40 ounces. I don't know, anyway. <clears throat> he says, we were fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and whereby nature, the children of wrath, God, the creator, has declared war on sin. And because he has declared war on sin, those who are engaged in sin are underneath the judgment, underneath the wrath, of the almighty God. God could not be a holy, righteous God if he were just going to ignore our rebellion. The God, the creator of the heavens and earth could not be the God that he is if he were just going to wink and say, boys will be boys and girls will be girls and let's not worry about it. If he were just going to take a light, casual attitude toward our sin. But the Bible says here that the wrath of God, ultimately, mankind will be punished for their rebellion. Truth of the matter be told is that 
you begin to reap some of that in this world. And ultimately, those who die apart from Christ, they receive eternal judgment. That's the bad news. Hell, yes. That's the bad news. That's the bad news. We were, we were messed up. We were dead in sin. We were controlled by the devil. We were disobedient. We were deceived. But there is some good news. There is some good news. I was at a funeral a couple of weeks ago, and the pastor who was talking got up, and he started his message off by saying, well, I got good news for you, and I got bad news. And the crowd that he was speaking to, even though we were in a church, it didn't seem like there was such a churchy crowd. So he got up and he said, uh, there is a hell. And the place got kind of quiet. I mean, like, like somebody might say, hey, what you mean talk about that at my mama's funeral? But then he said, the good news is you don't have to go there. There is, there is this place where the judgment of God is going to be poured out. And Paul says that even though we were, that was our previous state, he says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, wherewith he has loved us, even when we were dead, even when we were far from God, what did God do? He has made us alive together with Christ. Oh, there's, there's good news. Be Paul is writing to people whose lives have been changed. And he just wanted to remind them of what it was like in the old life. You were dead. You were controlled by the devil. You were deceived. You were disobedient. But God. But God, there was an intervention. The Almighty God saw you unable to save yourself. The Almighty God saw you headed in the wrong direction. And this God has intervened because he's rich in mercy. He could have left you to your own desserts. He could have left you to go your own way. But he made, he loved us so much. He came and intervened and has given to all of us the opportunity to change directions, to change our course, to change the master of our lives. He changes and I, I, I can begin to, I can make a choice, I can make a choice, I can begin to follow Christ, I can begin to, I can be a believer, I can embrace Christ, and when I do, I realize that it is only then that I'm made alive. When I was trying to do my thing, such thing, the little thing as I had, <laughs> I, I was dead. Some of y'all look at me and say, you know, I probably always wanted to be in church. No, I didn't need it. No, I didn't need it. I didn't always want to be here. Well, but, but God saw me in my rebellion, turned it around. Oh, there's something that we were supposed to listen to this morning. I guess it's gotten by us. This past week, this past week, there's been a lot of conversation around, we are the world. In 1985, when all those A-list artists came together to produce We Are the World, they say it's a miracle that ever came together, probably would never happen today when uh, all those big names, Michael Jackson, Ray Charles, Tina Turner, Lionel Richie, and Michael, all of them came together. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was a great moment. And you read the lyrics of We Are the World. It's, it's filled with inspiration, filled with aspiration. But they asked Bob Dylan about it after he had sung it. He said, well, to tell you the truth, I was really very uncomfortable singing it. We are the ones who make a brighter day. We are saving our own lives. We will make a better day, just you and me. We are saving its own lives, our own lives. Bob Dylan said, when I'm honest, I know we can't save ourselves. 
That's the world in its aspiration, in its hope that we can do this thing. We can put our shoulder to the plow and we can all cooperate and get on the same page and we can get everybody educated and we can begin to care for one another like we ought to care for one another. The problem is it ain't going to happen because we're too selfish. Because our agenda, we, we want to say... Um, in, you know, we kind of like this, uh, want to live on the, this a false concept that I'm okay and you're okay and you, we can do this thing. But God says, we're not okay. We're not okay. He says we're dead. And, and what does it mean to be dead in trespasses and sin? Well, let me give you, give you this little illustration. L little girl uh, slapped her brother and pulled his hair and her mother was rebuking her and said why in the world did you do that she said well the devil made me slap him but i it was my idea to pull his hair the devil made me slap him couldn't help myself there but it was my idea to pull his hair in other words it's in the nature of who we are. It's in the choices that we make. We are born con wanting to go contrary we to God's will and way and word. He, Paul says again, I want you to understand that we were dead, but God has intervene and what has he done he's made it possible for us to be raised up together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does God do? He lifts us from the lowest place to the highest place. God knows that the source and the direction of my life and your life is from the lowest place. But God is willing to intervene. And as the, we used to sing, some say sometimes in the church, he's able to find us where we are. He cleans us up and turns us around and he puts a new song in our mouth and we wake up and we say when I'm my spirit is open to God and I I'm allowing the Holy Spirit of God to work in me I'm done with that old way of life I'm done with that old stinking thinking I'm done with the drugs I'm done with the marijuana I'm done with the alcohol I'm done with living in darkness I am done with that because God has lifted me. And that's what he wishes to do in my life, in your life. And Paul says he's raised us up together. I was sitting in the lowest places, but now I sit in the highest places. I sit in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus because I am in Christ and Christ is in me I am now sitting in Christ Jesus and I have gone from the depths to the height and I didn't do it because I was so deserving but no he says for by grace and that's God's unmerited favor I am saved through faith not of myself but it's the gift of God. You know, we might walk around sometimes today we're like proud peacocks, thinking we all that and you know, but when it comes to salvation, it ain't true. Everybody needs a savior. Everybody needs a savior. The ground is level around the cross and we are saved by the grace of God. It's no boasting, no bragging about how pure I am, how perfect I have been. I cannot boast or brag in the presence of a holy God, but all I am is a person saved by the grace of God. I am so thankful that God in his grace and mercy intervened in my life and opened my eyes and turned me around and showed me there is
Christ. Well, uh, who's going to the Super Bowl next week? No, the teams, the teams, the teams. And who else? And where are the Kansas City Chiefs from? And where am I from? I'm represented because I'm from Kansas City. I was raised in Kansas City. That's my hometown. I am in Kansas City. You say, no, you're not. You're living in California. No, I'm in Kansas City. When it comes down to this, when it comes down to our eternal salvation, you want to be able to identify, I am in Christ. I am in Christ. What he did on Calvary's cross when he died, he did it in my place. He did it for me. He saved me. He did for me what I could not do for myself. And now I have become his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. The good works that come out of my life. First of all, we're not saved by good works but we're saved unto good works. We are not saved by our good works, but we are saved for good works. Anyone who is in Christ, their life moves in a new direction. And because it moves in a new direction, good works are the result, the overflow, the fruit of a life in Christ. How did all this happen? But God, no boasting of myself, but look at what God has done. And what God has done in the lives of this church in Ephesus is the testimony that God has done it in my life. And the testimony that so many in here could stand and say, was not I, but God. He found me. When I was big and talking and walking big and bad, turned me around and made me a new creation in Christ. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation this morning. And if you don't know the but God, I would invite you to come today and get connected with him. If you're not connected to a church, I'd invite you to come and get connected this morning. If you need prayer for your life, we'd love to pray with you today. We're going to sing, uh, stand please with me. We're going to sing hymn number uh, 99. Jesus has made it all right. Jesus has made it all right. Hymn number 99. We open the altar. We invite you to come for prayer. Whatever you desire to bring before the Lord, let's sing together. I once 